Chapter six, without mommy. Now I wanna preface this chapter by saying, I have um, two doggies behind me and um, that I'm keeping an eye on. So if you hear some barking, we're just gonna roll right through it. But here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, my classmates intoned. I loved reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I was usually the first on my feet to do it. But this morning, I mouthed along zombie-like, my head on another planet. My teacher noticed. Everything okay, Diane? He asked. Oh, I'm fine, I said, avoiding eye contact. Just tired. Thoughts of my mother blazed in my mind, but I vowed not to tell a soul that she had been taken. Only my best friends knew, and frankly, if I could have hidden it from them, I would have. That's how mortified I was. The day after her arrest, Mommy phoned home. From Poppy's side of the conversation, I pieced together the details. She had been taken to a women's prison in New Hampshire, and within weeks, she'd be deported from there. Yes, we thought about moving, Poppy told her, but I don't think they'll return. And besides that, I don't really have the money to move right now. I was surprised to hear them talking so openly since mommy was on a prison phone. Couldn't someone be listening in? Toward the end of the call, Poppy handed me the phone. Your mother wants to talk to you, he said. I took the receiver, my heart pounded in my chest. Before I could say a word, I began to sob. It's okay, Diane, mommy said, you're going to be fine. Your father is taking care of everything. I just have to go away to Columbia for a while. Why does everyone keep telling me it's fine? I understood that she, my dad, and Lily were all just trying to make me feel better, but things weren't okay, and we didn't know what would come next. I could see right through their words of comfort. Diane, mommy said, why don't you come to Columbia with me? I froze. I'd never even considered the idea of a life away from Boston, away from America, the only country I'd ever lived in. I'd grown up hearing about my parents' homeland, but it was a far world, far, far away. And I couldn't bear the thought of leaving my father and brother alone without me there to referee. My mind raced with reasons not to leave. No, mommy, I said, my voice shaking. I can't, I have to stay here. The line went dead silent. Take care of yourself, honey, mommy finally said. I love you. I'll see you when I can again. In the following days, I watched Poppy slide from shock into despair. One thing became clear. Poppy blamed mommy for her arrest. Behind his closed door, I heard him argue with her nightly over the phone. Why did she need to go sniffing around for those papers? He asked angrily. Why hadn't she listened to him? And why did she have to go around being the neighborhood socialite, letting anyone and everyone know their business? You're too open, he told her, just too friendly. Maybe it was the stupid paperwork that got you caught, but it also could have been someone around here who secretly wanted to take us down. Those were harsh words, especially for a woman sitting in prison. My dad hadn't meant to be cruel. We were in crisis mode. Panic and confusion came spewing out like toxic sewage. After mommy's deportation, Eric and my father fought nonstop. The arguments nearly turned violent a couple of times. Stop it, I'd scream, wedging myself between them, picking up where mommy had left off. I would try to distract them by making myself look crazy, by screaming and pulling my hair, just like I did when I punished myself for being a bad girl. I felt out of control and in way over my head. All I wanted was to finish up the school year and keep the truth hidden from my classmates. I tried to talk to Eric a few times, but he was just as overcome with grief as I was. His way of showing it was to cause trouble. My way of showing it was to disappear into my fantasy world into my television shows, into my music, into my Bible, into anything that would temporarily make me forget our sorrows. My usually joyful relationship with Poppy had gone quiet. In fact, we barely talked. Other than the same old, you cannot tell anyone what's going on, and my answer of, I get it, Dad. In between his wars with Eric and his endless exhausting hours at work, he sat hunched over the couch and stared blankly at the television. He was physically there, but emotionally far away. Mommy called frequently from Columbia. I miss you so much, Diane, she'd tell me over and over. You should come here, we could start over. Things are a little better here now than they were before. We could get you into school. But every time she brought up moving to Columbia, my neck became extremely hot. 
Instead of asking me to move there, I told her one evening, you need to come here. I wish I could, she told me. I would do anything to go back, but it's impossible right now. I knew that was true. But while she was setting up her new life there, I couldn't help but be angry that I was in charge of keeping World War III from breaking out in our house. I was like, are you kidding me right now? My life sucks without you, and if I have to deal with these yelling dudes one more day, I'm gonna explode. But that didn't stop her from bringing up the idea of me going there. It got to the point that whenever she called, I told my father to pretend I was asleep. I just couldn't bear to listen to it anymore. No one had prepared me for this. I'd always known that there was a possibility one or both of my parents would be taken, but what was the plan? You have to be strong, Poppy would always tell me. I got that part, but what would happen after I flexed my emotional muscle? Where would I go? Would child services pick me up? What were child services anyway? Would I go back to Columbia with one or both of them? There were no straightforward answers. I didn't feel like talking or eating. Dad would offer me rice and beans in the evening and I'd push aside the plate. Every night in bed, I was haunted by the same question. Did I do something to cause this? Did I displease you, Heavenly Father? I tried to be so obedient, I'd followed the rules, and yet God had allowed this very thing I dreaded to happen, and I didn't understand why. Two months passed, an utter surprise. Poppy came home one night with big news. Your mother's coming back, he told me. What? I asked, bewildered. She found a way to get back into the country, he said blankly. But how? I don't know all the details, he said in a way that told me there was more to the story than he was sharing. She'll be here tomorrow. Tomorrow? Jaw drop. A flood of questions filled my head. How could she have found a way to get back to, into the States? Was that paperwork somehow sorted out? What aren't they telling me? Poppy didn't seem thrilled. He seemed worried, which made me worry too. It's not as though I wasn't happy mommy was returning, but I feared it could put us all in danger of being arrested. The next evening around seven, mommy pulled up in front of our house in a taxi cab. Poppy and I rushed out into the driveway to meet her. My princess, she said, dropping her suitcase to hug me. Oh goodness, it's so good to see you both. Mommy didn't look like she had just been through a horrifying ordeal. To my surprise, her smile was broad, her clothes were cute, her energy seemed open. I imagined she'd be undercover, maybe in a hat and glasses or army fatigues like a secret agent. Neither mommy nor poppy told me the specifics of how she managed to get back across the border. To this day, I still don't know for sure, but I did know that only a mother who refused to be torn apart from her family would take the risk of returning. The plan was to move immediately. With mommy back, staying put was out of the question. My parents began making plans to go to New Jersey. We wouldn't stay with my aunt and uncle, and authorities might find us there. Instead, we find an apartment a few towns over. For a moment, it seems, things seemed like they were coming together for us. I gulped back the sadness of leaving Boston with the hope that New Jersey, we'd all be together. Until that day, one day after mommy's return, she was arrested again. That morning, my mother had been walking a couple of our neighbor's children to school. A side job, she, side job she'd done for years. Single mothers who needed to get to work early would bring their little ones to our place before school. Mommy would feed them breakfast and walk them to class. When I came home that afternoon, mommy's friend Lily was in our living room, same spot, same red eyes, same look of exasperation. It had happened again and fast. We couldn't believe it. Poppy had no words. When the ICE officer pulled up alongside her on the street and got out of the car, mommy began to cry. She knew what was coming. Ma'am, we're going to need you to come with us, the officer told her. And he placed her in handcuffs as another officer gathered the children. I'm not sure how or when the mothers received word that their children were being, being held at a local ICE facility. Whenever they did, Lily rushed to pick up her son, who was in the group. She then called my school and requested that they send me home immediately. When I walked through the front door, filled with dread that the worst had indeed happened, 
Lily was there waiting. She's gone, Lily said, pulling me into her arms. Your mother's been arrested again. Because we'd already been through this before, this news was both completely shocking and completely unshocking. It felt almost ridiculous. Like, was this really happening to us? How could my mother be taken not once, but twice? Following this arrest, Poppy wasn't taking any chances. We're moving, we gotta get out of here, he said. So we rented the tiny basement apartment of my parents' friend, Olivia. She lived upstairs. The place was sm so small that we had to get rid of most of our stuff. And dad put my little mattress on the floor in his room next to his bed. Eric didn't join us. He had chosen to move to New Jersey and try and start over there. I missed him, but I also knew it was better for him and Poppy to have a break from each other. Now I wasn't expecting the Ritz, but this basement was scary. The ceilings were low, dozens of boxes and storage bins lined the entrance. It smelled musky and moldy. The walls were crawling, and I mean crawling with the biggest rats in the world. Poppy worked even longer hours than before. He was sending my mother in money in Colombia on top of supporting us. In our dingy apartment, it was as if there was no distant distinction between Monday or Tuesday or Friday. They all went like this. Poppy got up, left for work, dropped me off with a neighbor upstairs who gave me breakfast and sent me off to school. I'd sleepwalk my way through the day and then watch Peanuts on Olivia's couch. For whatever reason, Charlie Brown was a source of comfort. I'd sit there eating endless Cheez-Its, one cracker after another, while peering at the screen. I was just passing time until Poppy came home around six. I think both of us were secretly hoping she'd magically reappear as she had before. But months came and went, and summer stretched into fall. No mommy. In school, I did my best to focus. My grades slid, though. I couldn't bring myself to pay attention in class. My only instinct was to rest my head on the desk and concentrate on not crying. My math teacher called Poppy. What's happening with Diane, he asked. She doesn't seem as interested in her work anymore. I'll talk to her, Poppy promised. I'm sure she'll get back on track soon. Of course, he didn't dare tell the guy the reality, that her family was being pulled apart by forces we had no control over, that I was practically motherless for the time being, that my brother was living away from home, that we were trapped in a living nightmare. Seventh grade is when things began changing for me physically. Ah, puberty, you wonderful, natural, normal, yet awkward friend. I was developing. And mommy had always been the one to make sure that I had clothes and undergarments I needed. She'd buy me cute cotton underwear and girly dresses. And now what choice did I have but to talk to my dad about it? Poppy, I said one night after he got home from work. Um. I need a bra. What? He said. Think it's time for me to get a bra, I repeated, cringing. My face was the color of strawberry jam. Honey, he told me, I don't think so. You're good. But I insisted. It was the most embarrassing thing in the world to be talking to my dad about a bra, but a girl has to do what a girl has to do. For a whole week, I begged him. Finally, he agreed. We drove to a, st a store in a strip mall. I clutched the seatbelt on the way over, consoling myself with the thought that this errand probably wouldn't take that long and that soon it would be over. We parked and headed straight into the preteen undies section. I wanted to get this over as quickly as possible, so I grabbed the first one I saw. This one's too big for you, my father told me. It's not going to fit. I wasn't positive, but I thought he might just be hiding a smile. It was, I was clearly clueless about what to pick. I slid it back on the rack and picked up another. That might work, he said. I grabbed three of them in various colors and practically ran straight to the checkout, like, let's get out of here already. Later on, Poppy called Mommy and told her about our adventure. Both thought it was hilarious. I'm so sorry I'm not here to help with that, she said to me, half laughing, half incredibly sad that she was missing out. It's no big deal, I told her, trying to be brisk. Whatever, it's just a bra. But truthful, truthfully, I wished so hard she'd been there. Showing my pain wasn't going to bring her back, though. Seeming unfazed on the outside allowed me to hide how vulnerable I felt on the inside. By Christmas of my eighth grade year, I would fully accepted that mommy wasn't going to return. My mind went straight to blaming myself. I must have done something so unforgivable that no round of Hail Marys had been sufficient to keep her with us. This must be God's will. Poppy seemed to have accepted it as well. 
With time, we each adjusted to the reality that life would have to move forward with or without her in it. And then she came back for the second time in January 2000. Not to Boston this time, but to New Jersey. The circumstances of her getting here were as mysterious to me as the last time. She moved in with her sister's son, my cousin, whom I loved very much. The first time we went to visit her in New Jersey, it wasn't exactly a sweet reunion. She was obviously thrilled to be back. I can't believe I'm here with you again. She kept saying as she hugged me, but honestly, I had mixed feelings. Of course, I'd missed her. I'd yearned to have her close again, but I was scared that she'd get arrested again, scared of yet another disappointment, that she'd be shackled and taken away from us. I didn't think my heart could take it. During our visits to New Jersey, Poppy and Mommy tried not to argue in front of me, but that didn't last long. I heard all the dirt. Poppy was furious about how careless Mommy had been in requesting that paperwork. And then again, when she'd walked the kids to school. And while he knew how deeply she missed us, he worried about how dangerous her journey back to America was. In February of my eighth grade year, Poppy and I moved from that basement into a two family house in Roxbury. The neighborhood was real scary. Gunshots rang out at midnight, reports of stabbings made the headlines, graffiti covered the buildings, and music blasted from car stereos. It wasn't far, but at least we wouldn't be at the same address if ice turned up. Mommy moved in with us shortly after that, and from there, things started to look up. There were some bumps in the beginning of our reunion. The truth is, though, even amid the bickering and the chaos, Mommy and Poppy's love for each other was still strong. And within days of her return, her spirits lifted, his spirits lifted. They argued, but with Eric out of the house, there was a lot less to fight about. Poppy was still hopeful about the lawyer. He assured us that even with Mommy's troubles, he could continue moving forward on Poppy's case. For the first time, I had my own room because we were in a different house and I hoped out of the reach of ice. I felt safe enough to actually sleep at night. Maybe I'd done something right to please the father above. Overall, it didn't take things long to feel back to normal, whatever normal is in a story like mine. 